Well, the Feminist Institute is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to collecting, digitizing, and sharing the rich history of feminist art, humanities, politics, business, and making our archive globally accessible for free. I'm Ella Tizi, and I'm with my friend and teacher of all things, Gloria Steinem, and we're here today to talk about archiving and mm -hmm. how it factors into our lives. Um, and thank you, Gloria, for being here and talking with me about this. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so I think, you know, when people think of archives, sometimes they it evokes uh, an image of a dusty cabinet somewhere in <clears throat> tucked away in a corner. But in reality, I think archives are really a a dynamic pursuit. And so I think, you know, that leads me to my first question, which is how can we understand archiving as a feminist act? If we consider how much we suffered from the politics of history, that is, women are 50% of the world, but not 50% of history. Mm. Uh, people of color are the huge majority of the world, but not the huge majority of history. Then I think it helps us to rectify it in the present and to uh, treasure and preserve whatever it is that has been significant to current events, political, personal, um, whatever it is that we have access to. Yeah, and like we were discussing before with that George Orwell quote, you know, who controls the past controls the future. <clears throat> Archives are so integral to how we understand and move forward into the future. And you've always struck me as someone who prefers to live more in the future than in the past. But I think at the same time, you're, you know, I think your apartment alone is a robust archive. It's full of stories. Everywhere you look is a story. Um, and I wonder, you know, how intentional you were about saving things over the course of your career um, and kind of gathering them around mm -hmm. you in this sort of gallery. Not intentional enough, uh, because I think that part of our disregard for uh, ourselves as women is that we don't really perceive the importance of what we're doing at the time. Mm. So it's, I'm really grateful to our colleague Amy Richards uh, and <laughs> uh, many other people who have entered my apartment and said, oh, you know, you, you must save that. That's so interesting. You know? <laughs> so we, we need each other because I do think our lack of self-regard turns up in our lack of regard for uh, the, um, the things we touch and work with and that really are important archives. My college, Smith College, has helped me because they have a very extensive archive and I can send things there, you know, that's been very useful. But I, I still suspect that archiving is a function of power and the powerless do it less. Yeah, and in many ways it's, it's so institutionalized. And I think as feminists and activists, we can come up with new ways to record our own, you know, efforts in a way that's not necessarily just wrapped up in an institution. I think there's definitely a place and a time for that that kind of assistance, but there's also this deeply personal level to the objects and documents that we collect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of your apartment, I think of coming in the door and seeing, you know, a hat sitting there. And to anybody, it would just be a hat, but it's Bella Abzug's hat. And right. there's there's such a history there to what Bella has done and how she changed the course of, you know, mm -hmm. women's rights in this country um, and knowing those things and having that personal connection, I think is also such an important. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if there are any 
particular objects that you have in your house, in your home, as part of your archive. Well, well since um, you, you mentioned uh, Bella Abzug's hat, on the wall just next to it, and sort of, you know, as you first come in, <clears throat> you see a poem uh, written out by Alice Walker. And I framed that because it was so important to me. And I hope I can only imagine it will be important in the future long after I'm gone. The, 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 the most uh, current object that is right there too is a soccer ball. <laughs> Have you seen that? Yes. Yeah, that Regan Rapineau and her teammates brought me. Uh, and I notice even now when people come in and look at that, they who are totally knocked out with, <laughs> with them as athletes are very impressed with the soccer ball. So uh, it, we, we invest uh, emotion and history in objects and they evoke that emotion and history back. Absolutely. And I think you know, you talk a lot about being there with all five senses and how that helps us empathize. And in some ways, you know, historical archives fall short in, in evoking all of those senses, but in other ways it gives us something to hold on to and something to kind of physically engage with um, in a way that connects us to our past. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something that you, we can learn from. Um, in a more visceral way than, you know, the the more regular run of the mill history that we read <laughs> right. in our books. Um, and you know, on the flip side, I wonder how archives have informed your research as a writer um, and the way that you've engaged with different subjects. Have you come mm -hmm. across any particular archives that you found broke open a story for you? Mm -hmm. The, as, <clears throat> as journalists and historians know, there are primary sources, and that uh, those are the words of the uh, person or institution you are researching, and they are very precious. I must say that for me, they're especially precious in handwriting. Mm -hmm. When I find someone's personal letters written by hand, it has a very... Uh, evocative kind of effect on me and it's the one thing I regret about computers because we we write so much less and of course computers are a gift in the sense that they record history <clears throat> much more easily and in greater volume uh, but there is something personal so I hope that we uh, continue the habit of signing at least. <laughs> I agree. Looking through your archives is that I've always been struck by the letters and how much they evoke the emotions of the time and and the issues you were working on and the kind of passion that was going into it. And I, I really wonder what we've lost as we've moved away from a tradition of letter mm. writing. Um, in, just in terms of capturing that. Mm. Well, it's still, it's still present in the computer age. And for instance, the reader letters that I get uh, in response to books or articles mean so much to me uh, that it's, it's sort of how you know <clears throat> that you have had some impact or helpfulness uh, in, in someone's life. Um, it's often verbal too, of course. I'm walking through an airport and someone comes up to me and said, you know, that I saw, so I wish I had a camera so I could record their story. But I, 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 I treasure those, those responses. Yeah, and I, I feel like they should be, they should really be treated as part of an archive because they are a reflection of the ripples of movements and, and how people reimagine them in their own lives. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And, and so, so much of, we, we don't exactly know when we're doing something as an organization or as an individual or as a group, what will be meaningful to someone else. Mm -hmm. And we need that um, conversation delayed in time to help us understand. <clears throat> At the beginning of Ms. Magazine, for instance, 
I don't think we would have had the energy to uh, even begin the difficulty of starting a magazine <laughs> if it hadn't been for the overwhelming response of letters to our preview issue. They just came in in mailbags and bushels. <laughs> uh, and it was that that gave us the uh, strength and the energy and the determination to start a magazine, which if we'd known how difficult it was, we might not have done. <laughs> and I think there's a whole book of those letters now. Am I correct? <clears throat> Mary Tom, maybe? Yes, yeah, no, there, there's a, 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 Mary Tom wrote a book, a collection of letters to Ms. But the letters themselves, the, by the thousands, are also there's a group an early group in Radcliffe and then then some at Smith because they were just coming in in mailbags and I hope that they will be useful to people in the future and and I know that scholars are using them yeah to that point I think to wrap up my burning question is I think a lot of people in my generation take access to information and the historical record for granted. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we are acutely aware of how much misinformation and omission there is in that historical record. And I wonder what your advice is to future generations of activists who want to chronicle their efforts mm -hmm. at a time that feels both mm -hmm. terrifying and monumental. Um, and what that might look like for mm -hmm. those of us who want to preserve a new kind of archive. Mm -hmm. I guess the simplest way of saying it is look at the overall, <clears throat> and if, if, you're, if our archive doesn't look like the country, if, I mean, okay, we're doing a women's archive, but does it look like the women in the country, you know, who and how diverse we are, then, we can kind of attempt to find a, a corrective. And it, it's very important because the imagery and idea and uh, uh, historical so-called reality of the women's movement is, is limited by uh, an illusion that Somehow, uh, I don't know how this happened exactly, but the women's movement is viewed as white. The civil rights movement is, so it's white women. Civil rights movement is black men. And somehow black women are not frequently recorded as much a part of both, especially in the women's movement, since black women are way, way, way more likely to be feminists than white women. We would know that if we just look at the present and who voted, for instance, for Trump and who did not. Something like 96% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton and a majority of white women voted for Trump. All right, that was true in the past as well. So if we look at the, the politics of the present and see that they bear no relationship to the past, then we can, I think, begin to fill in the past and understand that perhaps we are not seeing the whole history. That's excellent. I think that's a great lesson to come away with and work for us all to do. So um, thank you, Gloria. And thank you for bringing with you this amazing collection of items that we all get to visit and experience in different ways. Well, and I thank you for letting me know that they're interesting or valuable, which, <laughs> which I might not otherwise know. Thank you. Well, of course, my pleasure. And um, thank you also for working to fill in the blanks. Um, and I think that that's something that all of us can continue to do and um, do with fervor. So I appreciate it and thanks for taking the time. Thank you, thank you.